Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of the Planning Policy Commission. I'd like to call this meeting of the January 25th Planning Policy Commission to order, and it is currently, that's okay, 6.32 p.m. Today's meeting is a hybrid meeting. The Planning Policy Commission is in person, as well as staff. Comments at tonight's meeting may be made in person or virtually. For the record, we do have a few guests with us this evening. Welcome. For all who would like to speak during public comments, we do ask that you speak clearly and pause frequently, that you state your name each time before speaking, and if you are attending virtually or by computer um, and you would like to speak, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking, and if you're having any technical issues, try joining the meeting using a different device, such as a smartphone or tablet. You can use the call-in information and the meeting invite all into the meeting. Kristen, do we have a quorum this evening? We do have a quorum. Commissioners Milligan and Altamore have excused absences. Thank you. The first item, since we have no housekeeping this evening, is public comment. And because we're having a public hearing a little bit later, uh, this is general public comments for the Planning Policy Commission. We do ask that people that would like to speak on the public hearing that they wait a little later uh, for those comments. So, do we have anyone who'd like to speak for general public comment? There is no one in the audience who would like to speak, and there is no one online either. Okay. Great, thank you, Chris. Tonight we are going to hold a public hearing for the 2024 docket uh, list of amendments for the comprehensive plan. The public hearing will work as follows. Staff will make a presentation. Commissioners, we get to ask our clarifying questions. We'll open the comment period. We'll close the public hearing. A, a motion must be made and then we will go ahead and deliberate. So, I'll leave staff can go ahead and make their presentation. I believe Valerie is going to be presenting this evening, so when you're ready. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Valerie Porter, associate planner with CPD, and I'm here to talk to you about the 2024 docket of proposed comprehensive plan amendments. So for tonight's meeting, we are holding a public hearing to talk about the 2024 docket and also take any public comments. As Chair Voice just mentioned, here's the process for tonight's meeting. I won't go over it in detail, but we're on step number two. So while looking at the docket, there are a couple of questions that I'd like you guys to um, consider. One, are there any amendments presented on the docket that are not relevant or necessary? And second, are there any refinements that need to be made to the amendments that are presented? Here's a snippet uh, of the docket. It's over, spans over two slides, but this is the first um, snippet. Um, the first item is the population updates. As mentioned at the last meeting, we do this annually, um, and it's just to update the numbers. The second item is a rezone, which I'll get into a little bit more detail in a minute. And the rest of the items are um, updates to all of the elements that make up the comprehensive plan. In the packet this week, we provided a little bit more detail kind of showing what um, updates are occurring to what elements and showing also what uh, state requirements are prompting a lot of the changes. As part of the uh, amendments, the city is requesting a rezone, which is um, triggering a land use designation change. City Hall Northwest is located on the north side of I-90. Here is a map on the right showing the existing land use designation, which is capital facilities. Community facilities, thank you. And then the, um, the map on the bottom is um, the proposed um, designation, which is mixed use, and as you can see, it's comparable to the surrounding uses. 
Here's the docket process tonight. We're having the public hearing, um, which PPC will provide a recommendation. And then next, the docket will then go to the city council for review and a decision. The comprehensive plan is still underway. And so here again is a schedule. We'll be um, next providing a draft of the comprehensive plan. Um, the quarter two, we'll be providing the final draft for your review. And then hopefully uh, no later than quarter three, we'll have an adopted comprehensive plan. So again, here are the questions for your consideration. They are listed in your packets. And I also just wanna remind the commissioners tonight, if you were to um, provide a recommendation for approval, you are not approving the items um, to be, uh, you're not approving the items, you're just approving the items to be processed. So for example, you would not be approving the rezone today, you would just be allowing staff to then work on that rezone. Here are the options for your um, decisions today. You have the option to approve the docket as is. You can move one or more of the items to a following year. You can add something to the docket or you can um, not approve the docket. And at this time, I'll take any questions. All right, so we'll open it up for a clarifying question. And if you could just please state your name for speaking, that would be helpful for not only the recorder, but for our audience here now. Commissioner Kennedy. Commissioner Kennedy. So I think my basic question is, do we have time for that docket? It's a pretty beefy docket. Yes, we do. Um, like I said previously, we've pre presented a lot of the um, comprehensive plan elements already. Um, the only item I think that you guys haven't seen would be the um, rezone. So. It's definitely something that we've, um, it's in our schedule to process, so yes, we do. So follow up to that is, if it's on the docket and we don't manage to get to it for some reason, how does it just get pushed to next year? I'm going to use my lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we wanna include the kitchen, everything, including the kitchen sink on the list. So, and if we don't get to it, that's okay. Be added to next year's docket or not. Uh, the only things that do have to be done, however, are the state mandated requirements. Right, and just again, that's because you only get one opportunity every year to actually put. Any other clarifying questions? All right. Presentation. That's my life. Okay, so we are gonna open the public comment at 6.40 p.m. I'm just gonna go through real quickly some uh, small rules, but we do ask people that would like to make uh, comments on the record that they would unmute their microphone, that they would state their name, they would speak clearly and pause frequently, but they would limit their comments to five minutes, and then please mute your microphone when done. Uh, the same goes for anyone in the room who would like to speak uh, as far as the five minute timeline. So we will now open it up for the public who would like to speak. Is there anyone in the room who would like to speak? There is no one signed up online. We will close the public hearing at 6, 6 42 p.m. Now, before we can begin deliberations, we need to have someone make a motion in order for us to. Vice Chair Bader. Yeah, Vice Chair Bader, I move to approve the 2024 docket of proposed amendments to comprehend. Do we have a second? Commissioner Kennedy, second. Okay. All right, commissioners, what are your thoughts? Commissioner Patterson. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, I think the docket kind of shows what 
uh, we've been working on previously with the comprehensive plan and we'll bring that all to fruition and hopefully a completion so no changes or modifications from my perspective I think it all looks great thank you Commissioner Patterson Anyone else like to make a comment yeah I mean a fair voice here it's pretty straightforward um, we, Commissioner Patterson's point we've been working on quite a few of these elements already Kind of going through the motions, but definitely want to make it as possible. Definitely want to ask if say about the docket, and then I'll just say it speed up a little bit more time. Is uh, we are no longer the arbiter for the rezones. Yay! So now that goes to a different party. So unlike years previously, we will not be having a quasi-judicial uh, setting in here. Now this. This rezone basically goes on the docket and then it goes forward to the party. All right. I guess we just need to look for approval. Yeah, yeah, we'll take a vote. So, all in favor of approving the motion to for the 2024 docket proposed comprehensive plan, please raise your hand. Hi. So for our recorder, thank you. Moving on to regular business for this evening, we have one item, and that is to review the draft comprehensive plan arts and cultural elements. Kristen Leeson, our senior planner, will be presenting this evening. So Kristen, when you are ready, <laughs> she gets ready. This, this meeting's moving quickly, so everybody's got to stay with us. But uh, as Kristen gets ready, um, we'll wait her presentation. All right. <clears throat> Yes, good evening. I'm Kristen Leeson, Senior Planner for Community Planning and Development. Pull up my presentation here. Whoops. There we go. <coughs> Whoa, sorry. So tonight, we are talking about, it used to be called, FORMA, AKA, um, the cultural element, but we are proposing to change the name to the arts and culture element. And we're looking at the draft amendments. These were done by the, there we go. These were done by the Arts Commission. And so our purpose tonight is review and provide feedback on the draft element. So questions for you all to consider tonight. One is, are the goals and policies, specifically those that are included in the fostering arts and design section, implementable? Are they, are they strong enough? Do they have enough teeth? Um, the second is, are there additional topics that you feel should be added to this element? So the arts and culture element is not an element that's required by the state, but the city added it in 1999 just because we felt like it was important to recognize our cultural and historic resources. Now, thanks to Amy, we also have more arts as well. Um, by the way, we have Amy Dukes here, who is the liaison to the Arts Commission, and she is our cultural arts manager. Is that right? Okay. Um, the title keeps changing, but uh, she's our cultural arts manager and has worked to update uh, this element with the commission. So the existing element focus is really the basics and set on support the art and artisans, fund all the arts programs that you can, encourage art and diversity in our, our arts and culture exhibits and events, festivals, and then promote community diversity and participation. So they changed the focus just a little bit. Those are all, most of those are all still in there. But they added aligned goals and policies with the arts and cultural strategic direction in the art strategic plan. And then bring Issaquah's Washington State Certified Creative uh, District into focus. And we'll, I'll tell you what those are in a minute. 
and then acknowledge the community need for space for art production and art at community gatherings. So going back to the arts and culture strategic direction of the art strategic plan. Um, it's a little small, <clears throat> but what they have here, this is, this is their whole plan, and what they have though is the vision. What do they want to happen? And then what is impeding them or blocking them from achieving those visions? And then lastly, it's their strategic direction and how to get there. And what they've done in the element is they've really focused on these five directions, which are integrating arts into policies and systems, fostering the arts, increasing capacities to support the arts, expanding arts access, and then including uh, and celebrating the diverse and multicultural community. So that's really where the sections are now in the, in the element, or the way they're proposed. Second is bring Issaquah's Washington State Certified Creative District into focus. So back in 2020, the city, uh, part of the city, was designated as a creative arts district. And it runs pretty much from <clears throat> Sunset in fr front, north to about Gilman, and this is general, north to Gilman, and then west over to Gilman Village. And the state helps you to, it's part of it is to bring about economics, you know, better economic vitality in that area and to promote the arts. The state Washington Arts Program will help you to promote the area. When you are designated, you get $10,000 to do promotion. You can get up to about $50,000 to do capital projects to help um, spur uh, this. And it's just, they monitor and help you figure out how well you're doing economically. Um, it's, it's a pretty good deal. There are only 15 in the, in the state. And we were one of the first, so it's, it's pretty cool. Um, we also have acknowledged the community need for space, art making, and community gatherings. So the commission realized the more they started talking, we've got this creative district, and we need to have all these places for art and for building art and for gathering and celebrating. And so they recognized all throughout this element the need for additional space to do that. I'm just going to go over the new policies. Uh, there's uh, Most of those were that you know, were amended, they weren't huge changes, but please, if you all have thoughts on those, bring them up, let us know. I'm just gonna go through what's new, and then one other thing. So the first is to promote our uh, creative district, A7. And then B, we have uh, examine and adopt a process to encourage the integration of public art. Create an engaging public art master plan, which they don't have, and it'd be cool, to, that's integrated with parks, trails, and public spaces, and used to make informed recommendations about public art placement, and incentivize artwork through development and development regulations as a component of new development. And I will tell you, Amy and I were talking earlier today about B3 and B5 and kind of what the difference is, and really, and we're gonna go through and make some changes before you see it next time, but B3 is really more about how to get it Amy gets a percentage of, not Amy, um, but the Arts Fund <laughs> gets a percentage of capital facilities construction funds. It's a 0.5% that go into the Arts Fund, and that can be used for public art on public spaces. So B3 will amend it a little bit to clarify that. And B5, you can't require pub private projects, private developments to put in art. So B5, we're going to recognize, that's why it's incentivize it, and we're going to talk about how to incentivize that through the code without requiring it, and if we can get more of that. In Section E, continue providing land art, landmark designation and protection, protection services in coordination with King County. We started that back in 2001. Establish partnerships among cultural organizations to better match um, available facilities with needs and encourage the development and adaptive reuse of community acceptable artists, accessible <clears throat> artist studios, at exhibitions, and co-working. And I love this, access to tool, the tool libraries that can be shared and used by the community. <clears throat> Lastly is to conduct, a, because we're trying to make sure we have implementation in every, every element, uh, conduct an evaluation every five years that measures the effectiveness of the funding and regulations and programs in meeting the goals of this element. Uh, one that was proposed to be taken out were the Issaquah treasures. Who knows what the Issaquah treasures are? That's kind of what I figured. Um, the Issaquah treasures were adopted back in 1993, prior to our first comprehensive plan that was in 1995. And they were adopted by resolution by the city council. And they were, I'm just going to read this, recognized as significant community attributes 
to provide guidance in the preparation of the city's comprehensive plan as indicators of community values. So they've been left in the comprehensive plan just to help us remember what our where our community values started, what the values were, and kept moving. And we had proposed to take those out. Um, here's the list. There are 35 of them. We had to stop before it got to an actual person um, who was on the list. So they wanted to save actual Harvey Manning. Um, that couldn't be done. So, um, but we refer to this in the land use code as well. We use it in the land use code. So it, it needs to stay in here. Plus it shows how this whole thing got started. This is where it started. So um, that, while it was proposed to be taken out, is going to be left in. Um, so we're back to the questions. That's all I have. I just stretch it out, Jason. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, so again, are the goals and policies included in the fostering arts and design section implementable? And are there additional topics that should be added to the part, to this element? And I have Amy as here as well to answer questions. Great, thank you. And it, you're leaving the treasures. Yes, we're leaving the treasures, and right. it was that proposed. Was like it was proposed to remove the treasures, and we are going to leave them in. Yes. Commissioner Kratz. I've been looking for treasures. I haven't found any. <laughs> um, so this is all awesome. Uh, one question, uh, especially around public art, is how is support and maintenance? Because it's not just building it, but with a mural or something like that, making sure. Is that part of, of the plan as well? Because um, it's not it's, just, it's, I'd, I'll turn it over there. Thank you, that's a great question. It's not actually listed specifically in the arts and culture element, but it is something that lives in our budget. So we do have a maintenance line item. Um, and so far it's been sufficient. Um, we've had conversations, and I think this will be a good conversation to have during the master planning process um, about really being deliberate about the amount in the fund. So. Um, so that when we're adding new works, we're actually increasing the amount of the um, of the maintenance line item. Right now, it stays pretty stagnant. So, um, so we have one. It's been sufficient to date. Um, but I think master planning process that will be a good topic. We have grown our collection extensively in the last ten years, mm -hmm. and it is expensive to maintain. Maybe like in this, Mr. Uh, 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 in B, it's not just like, if you add the word building and support, that may help along the lines of just don't worry about it later, but it's, it's worried about it right at the beginning. Because, especially with murals, you know, you want to make sure people don't spray paint them. You have to maintain those probably more than other things. Thank you, Commissioner Krass, and thank you, Ms. Dukes. Vice Chair Bader. I have a question about the question. Um, how is <laughs> that for dragging this out? Um, I, I like the question one. So are the goals and policies implementable? Um, I feel like we haven't been asked that for the other elements. And so I like the question, but it makes me like wonder, is there something in those policies like the question? So. So you can thank Amy for the question. Um, <laughs> and we'll think about that for the rest of them. But I'm going to leave that up to her. I'm going to go back to you. Um, I think that that question actually is something that the Arts Commission was mm -hmm. wrestling with to some degree. And I just want to acknowledge that I have two Arts Commissioners here, um, Rachel Wright, our co-chair, and Chris Craven. Um, so thanks for you guys, and if you want to jump in and answer. But I think, you know, because this element is not a required element, um, and because we want art to truly be integrated um, into the built environment and into our community, I think we were just concerned that we're, when we're suggesting things like incentivize um, art and development, like is that something that we can actually pursue? Because I think the commission is very interested in pursuing it, but we want sort of the green light that that's something worth working. So it was really, it was really the group of volunteers. Um, so I, you know, I didn't realize that that's an unusual No, I, um, I request, like the question. <laughs> <laughs> I was intrigued by yeah. the question. Great, thank you, Vice Chair Bader. Commissioner Samueta. 
Yeah, and, and to Vice Chair Bader's point, I just look at like A7 where it says um, promote Issaquah's Washington State Certified Creative District identity, function, and outreach to audiences. So the word promote, you know, that goes to that point, like hey, how do you enforce that per se? But you, you answered it very eloquently as well. So um, it's more so a vision to be able to um, um, push art and promote it, but to a certain extent, you don't, you, it leaves it open per se. Yeah, that's a great observation. Um, we do actually have highway signage now on I-90 that I don't know if you've noticed it, but it's like one of the tiles um, on one of the signs that basically directs you to the Creative District. So there are some actual tangible things that we can do to promote. Um, and Arts Washington, as part of their um, Creative District program, has some very specific asks on how we promote. So, um, so yeah, there's a whole kind of complex um, variety of options for promoting the district. Okay. But good. some of them are literally putting a sign on the highway. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I was just looking for, I mean, you pretty much defined what, what that promote okay. entails, basically. And I'll, okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks, Rachel. Um, and also, there's definitely interest in um, incentivizing businesses that are within the creative district to either include art, um, you know, public art within their facilities, or to um, include creative uses in their buildings. Um, we know from um, a lot of the creative businesses and creative workers that are in the creative district and also just Greater Issaquah that it is really challenging to find space where um, they're allowed to do their art. We've had numerous um, numerous small businesses looking for space in our creative district and have not had great success finding um, building owners that would you let them have creative uses in the spaces. So that's another area that we're interested in incentivizing. Yeah, I think, I think that that's really good because, you know, the, the artwork will, will be renewable too. So you may run, I don't know, a mural or an, uh, a piece for a year and then where, where are you going to place it after that per se? And so that's actually good to put funding towards where you're going to place it after life, essentially. Thank you. Commissioner Kennedy? So I just had a couple language questions about um, some of the changes. So policy A5 um, talks about celebrate Native American cultures and the community's heritage and diversity through arts programming, public art, and opportunities related to cultural holidays, which I was thinking opportunities such as, are we talking about events? Yes, primarily events. Um, the city is also, um, actually I believe at uh, council committee earlier this week adopted the cultural calendar to move forward or they approved to move it forward to city council so there is now um, a established cultural calendar that the city um, recognizes and um, and so some of those holidays have real opportunities for community celebration um, so yeah events basically very cool so I just had a proposed sort of clarifying language that would just say, um, after public art, instead of and opportunities related to cultural holidays, say and events. Simplify it. That was just my proposed change on that. And then on A6, this one was a little um, harder to read. Encourage the use of local artistic and artisan talent in preservation, placemaking, public murals, sculpture, events, and programs, and promote local artists where possible. Um, artistic and artisan it seemed redundant, but that's just me being picky. Um, and then I don't know what mean placemaking means. So I was wondering, and I might be oversimplifying what you mean by the language, encourage the use of local artistic talent in the creation of public art such as murals and sculptures, as well as programs and events that promote local artists. 
Yeah, a placemaking would kind of encompass a lot of those things. So we can either list them out or we can say just placemaking. It, it is a little bit redundant. I mean, there's kind of a, sometimes placemaking includes things like lighting and other items that are, you know, like trees, landscape, architecture, and things like that. But um, we can certainly simplify it by not having such a laundry list. <laughs> I was just looking at the language and wondering how we could make it a little bit clearer and so far. Yeah, and the and I think the point of that um, of that uh, policy is really the focus is on local, so utilizing local talent. So right. yeah, so that's probably if there's less other words in the policy, it would probably you know dr draw your attention more to the point, which is that we're utilizing local talent. Exactly, which is kind of why I was I tried to sort of simplify it mm -hmm. to emphasize that aspect. Yeah, but that's that makes how I read sense. it as well. Thanks, Commissioner Patterson. Hi there, Commissioner Patterson. Um, I had a couple more questions about the Creative District Program. Is there a timeline designation for that, or is that a, I guess, permanent or semi-permanent um, <laughs> designation? That, that's a great question. It's actually a five-year uh, initial designation, and then there's a process for getting redesignated or continuing on mm -hmm. in the program. So we were designated um, in, I believe, the end of the first quarter, um, 2020. So. Um, we will start working on our process to redesignate um, pretty shortly here, actually. <laughs> nice. And then uh, along those lines, um, it was mentioned that there was funds for promos and capital improvements. Are those on like an annual basis or a program basis where you have to like apply to them or what's that? Kind Correct. Of? Um, we do have to apply. They're in the biennium budget for the state. So. Um, at least every other year, there's an opportunity to apply for a multi-year grant. We currently have a $150,000 request into the state and should hear in the next couple of weeks. Um, so sometimes the, the dollar amounts seem to change quite a bit depending on the way the budget for the state is going. But this year, or for this biennium, there was quite a lot of funding. So, yeah. Fingers crossed. Hope Fingers you get crossed. It. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, my last kind of comment is um, I'm recalling we in a couple elements we spoke about neighborhood characteristics and trying to uh, keep them. <laughs> and I, I, when I thought about arts and cultural, um, or in particular art installations and such, I was wondering if there was any opportunity to cross those over in a sense of if art goes in, maintaining the neighborhood characteristic. <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned that. When I went to the Arts Commission and I was looking at their list of things, I said, hey, we're about to go out and do all these neighborhood plans. And one of the things that we can do is talk about what's important to you all, what, what stands out here, and then maybe incorporate some art into your communities. But now, that came out of my mouth, but that doesn't mean that they agree with it or that, you know, but yeah, I think there is an opportunity to do that. Amy Nani. Yes, <laughs> and I also think that would be another discussion item for the master planning process, but. Vice Chair Bader, would you like to comment? Yes, I would. <laughs> um, Vice Chair Bader, I had, as I'm listening to your responses, it's, my question is like, is there a functional plan for the arts like there are for the, so, can there be, should there be? No, it that's like a lot of the strategies, right, that are being listed would live in a document like that. Right, and that's what, that's what their master plan would be. They okay. don't have one. What, I, what they have right now is the directive oh, slide. that, yeah, that I showed you, but yeah, they're gonna work on a master plan, which would essentially be their functional plan. Okay. So talking about setting up a process for the funds that we get from construction projects, public construction projects, um, and how that happens, and you, you know how they work, but yeah. They, yeah. I don't know what else would be in there. Yes, that yeah. is what that would be. Yeah, because it feels like a lot of the descriptors, right, that we're giving would live there instead of here, which is more high level, as I've heard. Yes. Um, so I, um, yeah, just to say, I think all, I, it feels implementable um, to me, especially given like the detail that you know lives behind it. Commissioner Kras? I think it goes back down to, in, uh, Commissioner Kras, um, we were referring to myself, so I'm not used to that. 
The, uh, in, the incentivize bucket, and this is more about outreach than incentivize. We have a major corporation that's based here called Costco, and could they really help underwrite a lot of the things that we want to have done within Issaquah um, that would take some of the burden off of getting money from the state to just be able to have almost your, your platinum corporate sponsor that helps with some of these things. And I mean, they're the biggest one. Um, REI, uh, they just announced layoffs today, so I probably wouldn't ask. Um, and other big benefactors who have employees here, like Microsoft and Amazon. They are benefactors of the arts, and I just wonder whether that would be part of, and maybe it's not called out here, of an outreach to corporate sponsorship. Yeah, I do love that idea. <laughs> um, I know the city has just adopted a new donation plan, um, so I think there is some movement in sort of um, how we go about um, those types of things like corporate sponsorship. Um, we don't have that um, budgeted at all or are in our plan in any way, um, but just to let you know, we do have another an additional funding source. Um, so in addition to that half a percent of construction projects, the bulk of our funds actually come from admissions tax on movie tickets. So um, that is our main source of funding. So when you go see a movie at Regal, your the, the admissions tax is bundled into your ticket price. Um, so you're paying about a dollar that goes to arts and culture. And you didn't even know it. <laughs> uh, Chair Voice. So first, let me just say that the call always seems to be ahead of the curve. And I think the fact that we have an element that's not even required, like for fantastic. Uh, I do appreciate that the board or the commission is also looking to hold themselves accountable by having a plan. I think both those things are excellent. The only, there's two things that caught my eye that were a little bit concerning for me. As we deal a lot with standards and designs. I'm always a little bit afraid of the word incentivize developers and have this city back and forth with development. That would be my only concern is I would want to encourage, but I wouldn't want to stipulate that, that would happen part parts out not every art or a mural on any side of it. But that's the only thing that really concerned me as far as the whole thing. I would like to hear more about metrics and I know you guys will develop that with your strategic plan. We've talked a little bit about traffic tourism Old Town, Creative District. I'm just wondering, do you guys, as far as the board, do you guys have any idea where those numbers lie? I mean, I always hear people telling me to come and visit out of town. It happens almost every time I tell somebody where I live. It's a great area. I love is the mountains, Old Town, everything. I'm just wondering, is there a way for you guys to track that? We don't have visitation numbers exactly, um, but we do, we have a, an interesting window into it just recently with the, um, the troll that was built. Um, and while we are not counting actual, you know, every person that visits, um, we are part of a geocaching initiative um, that is actually giving us a really good idea of how far people are coming. Um, to see the troll and our geocaching um, adventure for the troll just got some other kind of level of geocaching. I don't fully understand geocaching, but it seems very cool. Um, but a whole nother level of adventure on the geocache. And so that is something that is, is a new product for our geocaching company and they have all these metrics tied to it. So we're expecting a report soon from them just to give us an idea of um, so every time someone uses their mobile phone near the troll, we're getting all the data. I guess they've opted into that. <laughs> so we'll have lots of numbers, at least about the troll. And I think the assumption would be if they're visiting the troll, um, and actually they leave comments, and we're getting a lot of the comments um, forwarded to us. So we can link the fact that they're visiting the troll, and they're also visiting downtown Issaquah, going to a restaurant doing other things. So we have like, I guess some data that we can extrapolate, but we definitely don't have, you know, comprehensive visitation. Um, Visit Issaquah might have better numbers. 
Um, but that's a really good point. Like we should try to get the data that they have. I'd hate to step on the foot of anybody staff, um, but it'd be interesting to even something like QR codes that like troll to actually see the amount of people that are coming. To visit. Yeah, and there is a QR code There's at the troll as well, um, okay. and that is it links to the artist website. So they also are compiling data for us. So I'd say we, right now we have tremendous data about the um, popularity of the troll on the city's website and social media. Um, it broke kind of all the records for. Um, the city in terms of liked posts and thing, boarded posts and things like that. Um, but yeah, we should in another six months or so have much more comprehensive data about the troll visitation, so. Yeah, no, I look. Yeah. There's something like uh, with, with mapping traffic, there's cell phone ping technologies that cities um, subscribe to. I wonder if the transportation folks, if they do that here, utilize the same service around the, the troll is the big draw, right? So to mm -hmm. see the volume of people without having to take any action, just knowing that their right. cell phone came within a very short um, uh, area right. of, yeah. of the troll. And, uh, and I think if I remember correctly, sometimes that data includes where that, that phone, it's all um, uh, anonymized but uh, where they've traveled from. So that may give some type of heat map of where people are coming. So I'm not sure, I think some of this may exist. You may have to be licensed. You could decide whether it's worth it or not for this, but I know it's those, those tactics are used in, in traffic. Great, yeah, I'll have to check with some of our colleagues to see what they're already tracking. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate uh, Chair Voice. I really appreciate you guys. Like I said, I think the idea of coming up with a strategic plan is great. Um, I do have to ask, are, are you guys heavily invested in summer events that happen on Sunday? Because those are amazing. I know it's a little bit more difficult weather permitting, but uh, this last year I, I saw more events on Old Town than I've ever seen. I'm always familiar with the summer in the park. Um, there was Blue's Garage, there was I think three or four different places playing live music almost every Thursday night in the summer of Last year. Yeah, the um, Arts Commission has a granting program, and so we support our community partners to put on a lot of that programming. Um, so quite a few of those things were funded through the Arts Commission. That's yeah. And then one last question for you, Ms. Duke, is the Shell Station, right, the old Shell Station, Old Town, is that city-owned? Is So that would be one very, very small venue where you guys can do a little bit of arts and crafts. I know they do flower arrangement. Those are the type of small venues you're looking for in the creative. Sound like they're a little bit hard. Yeah, correct. Um, the city does own the Shell Station. It's currently occupied by the Downtown Issaquah Association. Um, but we have partnered with them to put things in th that space. Um, also, the, uh, the train depot we've used quite frequently, um, partnering with the history museums. So it's, there's not a lot of spaces that we have dedicated, but we have utilized the ones that do exist, um, the senior center, the community center, the lawns um, for Shakespeare and things like that. So yeah, we're trying to make the best of what we have, but we'd love more opportunities and more partnerships. And I think my, my last comment is just the commission pass. Yeah, I mean, being able to go out and get other sponsorships, private donations, companies, especially our hometown ones, fantastic. I don't, I don't know if it could be something like theater where you get a platinum package, something like that, but hopefully that's something the arts can do. I think there's a lot of people like myself who, who realize just how much Isaacal has to offer in arts and culture. We're biased, but between Snoqualmie and North Bend and Issaquah, a lot of culture here. And I see a lot of it constantly shown and, and, and visitors that come here that really enjoy it. So hopefully you guys are able to hold that, bring more visitors. And see, I share later. Yeah, just as I'm listening, to, I've been trying to like scroll and so it might be in here and I might have Missed it. What I what resonated with me when I was reading this is that it feels very like internal in like a really positive way. And so it's the policies read as if they're like encouraging both like creation um, within the city as well as like enjoyment 
um, opportunities for that creative work within the city. And so it felt very like for the residents. Um, but a little bit of the conversation I'm hearing now is also like how can the arts in the city bring people in um, to Issaquah? And I don't think I see that like reflected in the goals and policies. And so I don't know if that should be um, in there and is a goal or policy or if I've just missed it um, or if really the intent of this is for the community itself. Um, yeah, I think we can look back at where that might be inserted because it definitely is important, especially for the Creative District program. The intention is also to have visitation. Um, so, and the, and the Arts Commission is also interested in that visitor um, participation as well. And um, yeah, I think we could just look to see where to insert that. That's a good catch. Yeah, to Commissioner Krause's point, as far as the parks, again, a draw. And of course, arts are for everybody, all the residents. But the Vice Chair Bader's point, yeah, if we could actually make it on the reality all beforehand on deck, then that's better all around. Yeah, and they um, are just working on their, the Economic Vitality Commission and the Economic um, Development Department is working on their um, strat strategic action plan um, and they have uh, they're focusing on outdoor recreation and arts and culture as draws into the city so we have been working with them um, so it, it seems logical to find a place to kind of bring that into the yeah. wonderful I want to make sure everyone gets an opportunity to ask either Miss Duke or senior planner Lisa any questions not often we get visitors Okay. Oh, please. Thank you for having us. I'm Rachel Wright, and I'm the co-chair of the Art Commission. And I've been on the commission for three years, and it's been really interesting to watch because we have such an engaged commission right now that's interested in everything from granting to policy. And we're watching sort of all the tie-ins that come together, you know, for example, with the grants, we're using a lot more data analysis to figure out what are the real gaps that we need to help with. And the issue of space has been the number one thing that keeps coming up. Uh, a year ago, 50% of the grant requests that came through were for space. Alongside that, we're losing our creative community because you know, before the pandemic, we had Art East. And they closed, not because of the pandemic, they closed before. And uh, following with the pandemic, artists are working from home and they don't have collaborative spaces to come together. And we know that working together and networking is a big part of the creative economy. And it's been really interesting to watch because we now have this collaboration between the Economic Vitality Commission and the Art Commission where we're dealing with the issue from different sides, but we see that this is so integral to Issaquah. So it's been really great to work with them and to think about the visibility of the creative economy, what that means, and not just in terms of you know, the economics of creative designers, industrial designers, of course, software developers are included in the creative economy, but this issue of placemaking. And placemaking is really about how do we make Issaquah distinct and a place where people want to come to live and to enjoy and to play. So it's, it's everything from sculptures and murals to environment to you know, making it have a certain vibe about it that sets us apart. And there's a lot going on in Issaquah, but we can't really see it right now. Like, it's just as you're saying, it's, there's cool things, but we can't quite get a handle on all of it together. So that's really where the Art Commission is coming and saying, okay, well, let's raise the visibility of the creative culture in Issaquah, and let's continue in, to invest because it makes us a better community and it adds value to the community and I think even in terms of the sponsors, I'm not sure that they would sponsor into Issaquah, the city of Issaquah, but it's an important part of how they retain employees, attract employees, and they may start contributing in other ways. So I'm not sure it's a direct to our funding, but I think it's a really important part of engaging those companies. Well, Commissioner Kras, we'll never know unless we ask. So totally you, have, you, have, agreed. you have companies that are based here and you have ones who have lots of employees. I worked at Microsoft for 25 years. They spent a lot of money on art at the campus as well as they sponsored lots of 
So you know, absolutely. So all I'd say is give it a shot, and then you'll know. Yeah, and we're 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 really working to as well as you know sort of raising the awareness of other nonprofit organizations. Um, you know, it's interesting here in Issaquah, we have we really we have Village Theater, but most of the granting that we do is actually to nonprofits. They're doing art projects. So again, we've got these gaps where it seems like with as a community with so much going on that we should have more arts organizations, more spaces, and that's what we're trying to get at is what are the underlying issues? And some of them are simple, well, seemingly simple. You know, like we have uh, when when Amy was working on permitting the troll. The troll is, I believe, a was permitted under a shed, a sign. This the troll is a sign, and other artwork is done under a shed permit. We don't have an art permit, so at the art commission, we'll sit there and talk and say, why don't we have an art permit? <laughs> like that seems so logical. So it's this is the way we're trying to get into process and policy to say, like this is a significant part of our community, and we need to have the policies so that we can actually bring good things to life. Question based on what you're saying, that is really for Kristen of like, what zone do, would these art facilities be permitted in? Or like, what's their like land use? Like, I think they're, I, we, I don't even think we have a category because they would be permitted anywhere. I'll go back and double check, but I didn't know we if that have, was like a barrier. Yeah. Um, we have talked about the permitting issue with, with Amy. A troll is a sign. Troll is a sign. I would, I would say we have anecdotal feedback from artists who've tried to rent retail space um, around, and they've been one, one uh, studio in particular that does uh, art classes for kids and music classes. She says she's been turned down at 10 different places. Yeah, it's a challenge, for sure. Commissioner Singleta? Yeah, this is something we probably have to ask the staff, something that we may have to look at in, in, in this um, commission as well, and if, if that isn't, defined within our, our policies per se and make sure we look at it from a standpoint of not making it a barrier but almost an uh, opportunity for it to make it easier for the artwork to be displayed ac across the community I would just say one other example tied to that <laughs> and I've I've brought it up to City Council and, and other places you know, this, this idea of the sign code and the, the lack of an art permit. An example is the Brown Bear Car Wish is going on in, in Gilman. That is the gateway to our creative district. The policy came before the Design Review Commission to get reviewed. They have a long wall that is not allowed per the code. So there needs to be something to mitigate the long wall. So the Development Commission says, how about a mural? That would be great in our creative district. Well, we bump right up against the sign code because in that mural, you couldn't have bears, because bears would be a part of the marketing of the brand. So when we talk about making it easier or incentivizing, it's really this, how do we take a company like Brown Bear, who is not a creative business, but could participate in a creative district via artwork, but we're setting up our own blocks to make it hard for them to put a mural that relates to their bears. The bears, like if the bears that are on over by Taco Time, you can't put those bears in the creative district because of the sign code. So that's we're we're looking at very like tactical things where it's like black. it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Black bears, good idea. Yeah. Wow. So the one the 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 company mascot that bear statue that bronze out there will not be replicated. Over Correct. Correct. Wow. Even build their car wash without. All right. Are there any further questions for Ms. Ray? Uh, Commissioner Patterson, uh, can we go back to the issue of space topic a little bit? I'm yes. curious what some of those barriers are. I mean, you kind of alluded to um, retail space or mo money being uh, given the permission to, you know, rent or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, what are some of the other kind of characteristics of that issue of space? Well, it depends on which area you're, you're looking at. So from the art making perspective, you know, the central issue is when you make art, you make a mess, right? And you need certain things in the buildings, like you need to have a sink to do paint and ceramics, things like that. So there's first the lack of actual spaces that have the, the amenities that people need to make. The second part is damage to the building, so that's what people are saying no to. They don't want, you know, like a room like this, you don't want to damage the carpet, that kind of thing. So that's, that's the first part. Um, the second is just really, um, 
you know, the kind of space that would be appropriate to actually create more of a community. You know, we have a community center, we have a senior center, we do not have an art center. So, you know, if we look at other cities, you know, there are performance halls, and, you know, well, there, here's an issue um, that's it's kind of unbelievable. Uh, Isqua has the Isqua Philharmonic Orchestra. I did not know that until I joined <laughs> the Art Commission and saw their grant. Well, they do not perform in Issaquah because they do not have a place. Now, they have tried to perform at the high school, but the high school has stopped renting out their performance hall. Um, there's lots of different reasons that change. The current one is due to COVID restrictions. So we have a performance hall, we have a philharmonic, but we can't match the two of them together. So it's, it's again, those tactical things like that of how do we, how do we open up. They, they perform um, over uh, in Sammamish. They did the Nutcracker down in Renton. They don't perform here. Um, and then basically, you know, other, other cities have things like really thinking of things as a creative hub. So it's a combination of artists and residents who have studios together. People like to come through and actually see the, at the making process. It's typically paired with also being a hub for local nonprofits. So it's, it's those kinds of things. We're, we're a city that you know, should have those anchors. We have Village Theater, but we're missing other, other components. They're definitely community draws. Great presentation. I want to thank and Duke's fantastic advocate for your guys' work. Again, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Thank you so much. Are there any further questions for either of you? Okay, thank you. Great discussion. All right, that concludes our regular business for this evening. We're going to move on to report. I believe, Annalise, you're up. I have no reports. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving on to other business and announcements. I don't have any of those either. Okay. Let's <laughs> make it a quick exit. Is there anything from the commission? All right, well, I want to thank everybody for coming, including um, the Arts Commission, as well as staff, commissioners, and we will keep you posted on the February 8th Planning Policy Commission uh, through email. Otherwise, I, you guys all have a wonderful weekend. We will conclude this evening's C meeting at 730.